Hey guys, today's podcast is going to be a bit different. Instead of Chris sitting down to talk to someone, I'm turning the tables on him and putting him in the hot seat. Stay tuned to find out more about the voice behind the lifestyle chase. Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. Proudly hosted by me, Chris Little. Without further ado, let's get started. Hey, Chris. Hey. How's it going? Good. Are you nervous? I don't know. Are you nervous? A little bit, but <laughs> I <I'm> alive. Got you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for those listening, Chris posted a question on his Instagram earlier this week, or I guess by the time this goes up, it'll be last week, about who we should have as a guest here on the Lifestyle Chase. I submitted a few suggestions, but one of my responses was for him to let someone else interview him. I probably didn't think that one through too well because I got tapped and I now get to put my own idea into fruition. So here we are with the list of my questions and some tea. And uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon recording the 11th episode of The Lifestyle Chase. As a disclaimer, I will admit that I am not as natural as Chris when it comes to having candid conversations, so I am (laughs) using a bit of a script and wrote down a lot of my questions. Um, Chris tells me I do need to introduce myself. So I'm Kelsey. I've been bugging Chris, uh, mostly through social media, I guess for i think it's been over a year and a half now sounds like that yeah so he uh yeah poor chris has been putting up with with my sass ever since so um i first came across chris when he was doing a yg fitness instagram takeover he was talking about balancing all the different things that he had on the go at the time and i could relate and i didn't know a lot of people that were in that same boat So at the time I was working two jobs and working on university courses online and it was really nice just to see someone I could relate to because yeah I didn't know a lot of people in in that situation. So I sent him a message and just kind of told him to like keep on keeping on and that I could relate to him and stuff and uh, yeah he's been putting up with my comments ever since. Is there anything else you want me to add? Uh, That pretty much sums it up. You did a good job. Keep it going. Oh god. Okay. So, let's get into my questions then. So, I want to go back in time a little bit and talk about your childhood. Paint, paint a picture for people of what shaped Chris into the Chris we all know. Um, so, um, one thing we have in common is we both grew up in rural small town areas. So, what was a day like for you as a kid? As a kid, I had a pretty easy life, like... I grew up on an acreage that had a lot of space for running around. My parents really like having sort of a walking trail behind our house. Sweet. And so basically behind the house where I grew up, there's a big yard area that I would call a soccer field. And so I would obviously play some soccer there or sometimes we'd set up a badminton net, stuff like that. Like it was just a big giant playground. We had a swing set. Um, We had like a hockey net, stuff like that. And then after that, when you go further, there's a giant garden. And my mom, at one point, she sold edible plants. That was when I was a little kid. We would go to all the different uh, greenhouses and stuff, and she'd sell those. Um, But that was sort of short-lived. But they've always just loved gardening, so it's always been a huge garden. Uh, my dad grows a lot of trees. That's kind of his thing. Keep going past that. And over the years, we've kind of created a sort of like camping site. Uh, my parents had a camper that fit their old truck, but then they changed the box size on trucks. And so we had to park the camper permanently somewhere. And we put a roof on it. My dad put a... Uh, solar panel on there so then you don't need to have it operating off a battery then it just keeps going and you just put a propane tank in there and it's a fully operational little cabin and my dad built uh, an outhouse and we got a clearing area and a little fire pit so it's a nice place for picnics keep on going and then there's a patch of trees with like a well-groomed set of uh, trails in there and if you get to the very end there's a little gate open the gate and you're out to a pasture of cows so it's really nice like I, I grew up in like a picturesque area. Uh, I liked just going for walks, like being with my thoughts. Uh, 
I think I've mentioned earlier, there's a bit of an age gap between me and my siblings. So while I had lots of time where I could play with them, there was a lot of time where they had already moved out. So I kind of lived the best of both worlds where I have siblings, but I also spend a lot of time by myself. And that's, that's kind of what it was like. Just roaming around. Did you have to get up early in the morning to help with anything out there? Or? The thing is, I'll be honest, I was like a farm kid that kind of grew up like a city kid. Hmm. Because I know there was a saga of time where I'd get up with my dad and help and like feed the cows grain and uh, fork off the hay and stuff. But I would always start coughing. Oh, so like we were thinking that I had some allergies yeah. or asthma or something and my dad just felt bad and he didn't really bug me too much with it. But one of my favorite activities that I could usually be counted on for was chasing cows. <laughs> I just, I liked racing them. I liked yelling, yeah. I had a tra- traumatic experience as a kid. Uh-oh. My, my dad put me by a gate and he was like, all right, so if the cows come near you, You say, yeah, but these things are huge. Like cows are big and I was like three or four. Mm. And so these big cows come towards me and I like freaked right out. And I just remember shaking and crying. And then my dad was like, oh, I think I screwed that up, (laughs) but it's okay. I, I got over it. And I think my best memory of that day, it like turned around real quick. One of my brothers put me on his shoulders and we ran around. So I just remember like going super fast in the field. And then I felt a lot safer up high. Yeah. So while cows are scary, I think I- I'm not like forever scared of cows. Like now, now I'm the boss, the cow. I'm, <laughs> I'm in charge of the cow. Do you ever tip any cows? You can't tip cows. Like I don't care how much TV you watch, you can't tip cows. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> so as a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? That's an interesting question because there's a lot of different things that that I could pinpoint. But like thinking it through, I remember watching Oilers games and between like the announcer and the guy that makes like the videos at the start, like mm-hmm. that give you goosebumps and just get you all pumped up. like. I, I think it would be really cool to be the announcer that announces all the players mm-hmm. or to be the one that makes the videos. That's like, there's a lot of jobs that I'd want to do, but those were always ones that like reoccurred a lot. And that's probably why I like making videos now. Yeah. It's just exciting. Cool. So as a kid, you're talking about how you had that space in, out back and the cows and stuff. But So other than like playing soccer in the yard, what kind of things would you do for physical activity? I think something that was pretty reoccurring that would always come up was I liked going for uh, long bike rides. There was usually like my, my thing is we kind of had sort of this, this square, you just go around at each corner on the gravel road. And I, I can't remember what distance it works out to be, but it's, it's, we would call it going around the block, but it's a lot bigger than a city block. Obviously. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Um, that was kind of a routine. I had a few neighbors. I had one next door neighbor and if I could, I like meet up with him and we, we'd ride together. And that was always kind of cool because we just chat and sometimes neighbor dogs would join our convoy. It wasn't ideal, but you know, if you make friends, make friends. Um, and then one day I remember challenging myself. I was like, you know what? I'm going to bike to school and to put it in perspective. Like, it's like a 15 minute drive. (laughs) So it was like a one hour or more bike ride. And you start that off in gravel. And if you've ever ridden in gravel, it's, it's got some challenges to it. Yeah. But I imagine all of that bike riding probably attributes to my enjoyment of spin. Probably. You never know. That makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. So thinking back to your childhood self, if young Chris could give today's Chris a piece of advice, what do you think it would be? Honestly, as a kid, I uh, I kind of let other people tell me who I was or what I could be. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a few memories that kind of stand out because I would say I was one of those sort of like middle of the road kids, like not the most popular, but not a complete like 
sit in the corner by himself kind of thing. Like I, I got along with everybody, but there was definitely times when I could pinpoint that I was bullied. Mm. Um, in grade six, we had a class election and I was really excited about it. I was like, I'm going to run for president. And like anybody, anybody can, uh, can run for any position that they want. Yeah. But I remember in like the days approaching, there's so many people that were like, well, I, I wouldn't say so many because obviously the outcome would disprove this, but I had a few people talk to me and be like, you know what, like Chris, why, why did you even try to be president? Like, you're not gonna be president. This other person's gonna be voted president. And I was like, I can be president, like just like anybody else. Mm -hmm. But I remember that really bothered me. And like, I, I remember how upset I was but then they had the vote and then I was president and I was like, you know what? Like everybody's always going to have some beef with you, mm -hmm. especially if you have like a passion or a motivation that they, they wish they had. Like it's usually if somebody's picking on something about you, it's because you have something that they wish they had. Probably. Yeah. So if I could give young Chris advice, I would be like, Hey, this is your jet fuel. When you're getting picked on, you're doing something right. So keep doing something right and just keep compounding on those things that you're doing. Be yourself, no matter what, be yourself. That's pretty good advice. Um, so if little Chris could see you today, what do you think he would be most proud of? It's funny that you say that little Chris, get it? Ha ha, ha ha ha, last name joke. Yeah. I get to make the joke sometimes. I Everybody else it. making them throughout the whole life. If little Chris, little, little Chris could see me today, I think he'd be pretty proud of the fact that I actually picked some things that I actually really wanted to do when I was a kid and did them. I remember it was probably a junior, senior high school sitting in, it was usually like a health class or a phys ed class because those were things that I was like, you know, I'm like really good at this stuff. Like, my, my calm class, I know a lot of people scoff at that, but like I got 100% calm class. It means I know how to live my life. <laughs> he depends on your calm teacher. I don't think I learned anything in my calm class. We just watched movies all day. My calm class teacher took things really seriously, so. Oh, that's good. We, we have held a high standard. There's a lot of life skills that I wish they would have taught us that they didn't. We actually learned things like budgeting. See, that's useful. Like all we those things that. that go out there about I wish that Calm Clash taught theirs. Yeah. We, we actually, actually did. learned a yeah. lot of those no, things. No, we definitely did not in the class I had. Missing out, should have gone to Pigeon Lake. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would have preferred that. I, probably. Um, yeah, I moved to the city when I was 16, and I really missed the, the small town school. Like, I used to know almost all my teachers by their first names and stuff, and I did really well in school until I moved. Uh, and then wasn't wasn't the best after that. That's fair. Um, so generally speaking, our families play a really big role in shaping our identity and, and who we are today. So I'm curious for you, because I know that you're pretty close with your family, um, if you had to name one quality that you admire and maybe a quality that you inherited from people in your immediate family, what would they be? One quality that I admire and one quality that I inherited. I'd have to reflect on my parents first and foremost because obviously they created me and That's a good observation <laughs> i'm good at observing these things uh my parents are are really good at having integrity like they're also very very loyal and i think one thing that i've reflected on in the past year is how many different things my parents have done with with very little to no self-doubt, or at least they battled through it when there's been self-doubt. Like my parents have tried a lot of different careers. Mm. My parents have uh, kind of attacked a lot of obstacles within the career, whether it be like challenges in the workplace, challenges in like what they're doing kind of thing. Like my dad, for example, he's sold grass seed, he's written articles, he's, got a lot of different education. He's uh, worked in Musquachese for a lot of different projects to essentially make people's lives better, similar trend. Uh, they're both essentially teachers for the majority of their career. 
Uh, my mom's worked at a museum. My mom sold the edible plants. My mom's done crafts like uh, doing ornamental wreaths. Like they've they've done the hustle, and so I think that's probably what makes it easier for them to encourage me. And it's just that they've done it, and they're they're here to tell the tale, and they're genuinely encouraging of me kind of thing and I think that's probably where I get that from I think that's why that's a characteristic that's so strong in me because I got it from my mama and my dad <laughs> and my dad that makes sense yeah because I mean you've even just recently switched careers and stuff yeah and then I kind of want to rope my brothers into it too because they've essentially been like mentors my whole life they, they've been older enough that what they say has always hold, held some value to me kind mm -hmm. of thing so my oldest of the old brothers he is usually like the devil's advocate kind of keeps me on the train tracks if i'm doing something ridiculous he'll at least give me the other perspective and i i don't always listen but i always hear it um and then that other not as old older brother he is the one that kind of encourages me to to try the thing like not that they both don't but the one is more an outside of the box creative thinker and I think he probably exhibits probably more qualities of my dad whereas the other one exhibits more qualities of my mom so they're kind of just an extension of my parents right and it's just a really good foundation to have that kind of support and love kind of thing in a family's support system that's awesome all right so changing gears a bit you have shared with me a bit in the past about your story and journey and, and um you've you've mentioned how someone's negative opinion of you has kind of been a bit of a driving force at least at the beginning of this journey that you've taken um so i'm curious would you say that You've, it's become easier to ignore people's opinions if they're not necessarily supportive or maybe do they play a different role in your life now than they used to? I think sometimes I have to uh, take a step outside of my my box and be like, hey Chris, uh, you're not that old right now. Like I'm, I'm 26, so I still got some maturing, some growing to do. And while a person being like, yeah, hey Chris, you can't do this or this isn't possible is always going to motivate me. I think the more mature stance I've, I've adopted over the last year and just learning more about myself is that, hey, it's less about what they think I can't do and more about what I think I can do. And I'm really practicing on just telling myself I can do it and nothing else really matters. There's tons of things. I could line up a bunch of people and just make sure that each one of them said that I couldn't do something. Like I, I know enough people that everything that I wanted to do, I could be able to find somebody that said I couldn't do it. That's not a problem. I think everybody can do that. Yeah. I think the, the bigger catalyst in, in what inflicts change is you actually saying to yourself without any doubt that you can do it. Right. And then you don't really worry about it. So as I get older, I get better at actually doing these things. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what uh, growing older is all about. Just uh, learning about yourself and developing. Yeah, I know for myself, it's always it's kind of shifted to be, instead of other people's opinions mattering, of thinking like, hey, what do I think about myself? And if I'm okay with myself, then then that's enough. I'm, I'm getting on that ground. It's It's easier said than done for sure, but... Yeah, there's a lot of naysayers out there, so it's good if you can block that out. Haters gonna hate. This is true, but yeah. I mean, sometimes people have good feedback, but sometimes it's just people are not happy with themselves and it reflects in the way they talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, so for a lot of people, they are their own toughest critics and their inner dialogue can get pretty rough. In contrast, you often have posts um, about how you can inspire someone else and, and how you care about other people's goals and successes. Do you find it equally as easy to encourage yourself as it is to encourage others? It's kind of a layered situation. I think when, like, 
all of this stuff kind of evolved over time. There's been a lot of people who have sort of tried to coach me to keep a certain message because it would get a better, a greater impact. But I think if I do a long post, it's because I needed that. And that message that I'm giving out is something that I needed. Um, inner dialogue, like when I'm pushing out positivity, sometimes that's exactly what I need. I've learned that uh, I could just do that for myself. I could just do all these self affirmations and just put it in a journal or something. Mm -hmm. But the whole process has has encouraged so many other people that if it's something that I think is appropriate to share, the the chance that it'll impact others is, is greater than the chance of it not kind of thing. Yeah. But um, it's definitely hard to encourage myself. Uh, one thing is that I just, if, if I'm able to to find a way to encourage myself through my words, then then that's usually helpful. Like half the time, if I'm like pumping the pom poms on the internet, mm -hmm. that's for me too, and that's kind of somebody reads something and they're like, oh wow, like that that really encouraged me. Like I'm encouraging the crap out of myself, and we're <laughs> just lucky that other people are being encouraged too. That's fair. So it's like they're the secondary exposure. I'm like killing two really birds with one stone. There you go. I'm cheering myself on, but I'm cheering other people on through that. Gotcha. So I mentioned earlier that our paths have crossed with the millions of things that we've had each on the go. Um, so, I mean, you were getting up before the sun to lead spin classes back then and hustling pretty much all day long. So I want to paint a bit of a picture about how much your life has changed in the last year. So can you break down for everyone listening what it was like back then for you, like a day in the life. Life was crazy. So probably around the time when I did that YEG fitness takeover, I was working a full-time job that could have me working like at least 43 hours a week. I had, I was involved with YEG fitness in the way that I would sell advertising for a magazine or a website and the structure of that is basically you you use the spare time that you have you can contact leads you can build relationships you do phone calls emails visit gyms stuff like that so it could be like two hours a week but sometimes it could be 20 hours a week so we're stacking that on top of that too um i wanted to get more in the role of leading fitness or having some kind of an impact in the actual like physical wellness and so I was pursuing some training credentials so I actually was kind of going for both avenues I wanted to get the certification so I enrolled in CanFit I was doing some studying for that but then I also wanted to get as much uh additional knowledge as I could. So I had enrolled in three Nate courses. So I was doing the three Nate courses, studying for CanFit, full-time job, 43 hours a week with 10-ish at Yeg Fitness, and I was a spin instructor at True Ride, doing two to three classes a week. My typical day, usually like if it was a Tuesday, for example, I woke up at like 4.30 or 5 to get to the studio for 5 30 uh, taught the 6 a.m class showered went to work for six no went to work for uh, seven ish seven thirty. yeah kind of depend on the day i was kind of a an eager beaver mm -hmm. like our our shift wouldn't essentially start till eight but I'd try to get there seven thirty, open yeah. the gates kind of get things rolling I, I had a pretty positive attitude and then we would work on that until about 5 p.m. in which I'd usually go home and that's if, if I fit any uh, Yeg Fitness in, I would fit it in then. But then I also had the assignments I'd work on for Nate. I'd find myself, if, if there was like a test to study for, actually like most of it was like multiple choice type stuff. Mm -hmm. um, if I had a test, I, I was in a position where there were so many things on the go, I would end up at the deadline. And they would be like, okay, if you don't submit this test by midnight, you don't get the mark. And yeah. there was about three of them. 
where I submitted it by like 11.55. <laughs> like I had alarm set on my phone so that Can't I pressed close. submit button on time. Because if you didn't, then you it wouldn't count. Yeah. So yeah, like I was flying by the seat of my pants. Like I remember thinking to myself after all those, the three Nate courses were done. Because it ended up, I was just getting so many ongoing education stuff afterward that I just chose the avenue to uh, stick with Canfit. Hmm. But I remember being so nervous about the Nate stuff because I was flying by the seat of my pants. Like everything I did was just like barely in time because I had yeah. so many other things on the go and I was like, am I going to fail this? It definitely adds to stress in your life. It does. Like I remember just being so flustered. Like some people are like, Chris, like, are, are you focused? Like we're, we just noticed that you, you look like you're somewhere else. And I was like, well, kind of I'm right. doing like six things at once. So yeah. I mean, you got to understand but uh, yeah, and I passed those neat courses, so I patted myself on the back for that. That was such a good feeling. Yeah. Because I was like, how? How did I do that? But it just kind of goes to show if you want something bad enough, you can get it. Yep. Yeah. It's all about that hustle. Totally. So in comparison to like today, the snowy Sunday, <laughs> what's a day like for you these days? These days, it's just a full on adventure. So, like, now everything that I do, if, if I want work, I pretty much create that work. Like, I work at Central on the weekends, and that, that's something that's structured. But sometimes I'll work one shift in the weekend, sometimes I'll work three shifts in the weekend. And it's, every time I'm working, I'm like, all right, this is sweet, I'm gonna pay some bills. <laughs> that's, a, that's important. But, yeah, outside of that, like... Every client session I have now is based on somebody reaching out to me or I've talked to them about training and they're like, let's do this. Like I'm not working at any kind of a, a gym where they're just feeding me clients or anything. Like it's all it's all based on word of mouth, referral, and just people that I know that just want to train with me. Yeah. And I've been lucky because I think that I've been putting out a message that resonates with a lot of people and I've been proving that I have quite a bit of knowledge when it comes to training and I have a pretty good roster. Like I'm growing it month over month. We just had to move across the city. So, I mean, that'll, that'll affect your, yeah, your clientele. Not sure. everybody wants to drive 35 no. minutes or anything like that. It's true. But yeah, every every day is a hustle. Every day is different. Um, I'll toss in some podcasts some of these days. I like to keep busy. I'm working on my precision nutrition. Cool. So that takes up some time. Yeah. Um, but I always I always make sure that I prioritize things like social interaction. That's kind of why I did the podcast. And I always make sure that I'm doing something that's going to help me in the future. And it doesn't matter if that makes money, as long as it's going to help me. If it's if I don't have very many client sessions that day, I better damn well be learning. Hmm. That's kind of my rule. Like yeah. I have to do something productive every day. Don't worry about money. That seems to work its way out. Hmm. Don't ever say no to like an odd job or something. Like sometimes you, you got to shovel snow or sometimes you got to, like I, I set up a Alberta milk booth at the world's longest hockey game. Oh. It was like the first couple of weeks after I quit my old job. Yeah. And it was because like, that's what you do to make stuff happen. Yeah, you have bills, so you yeah. pay them. You don't have to overthink it. Just make that money. That's true. It is important to pay your bills, too. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we all like having roofs over our heads, so yeah. just keep on doing that, I guess. Yeah. So, in comparison, I guess you can say that you're not leading the spin classes anymore and you're not working that regular 9-to-5 job anymore. Exactly. But you still are doing some kind of education on your free time mm -hmm. and you're just hustling yep like before everything had its place like on monday i do this on tuesday i do that mm -hmm. on wednesday i do this and like now it's i have some clients with reoccurring time slots i have some clients that are this day or that day some of them are once a month some of them just come to see me to just practice a certain technique or learn a certain technique okay but yeah every day is different but having a really positive mindset about things mm -hmm. makes makes me move forward consistently. That's good. Do you miss having that structure though? Not really. I think it's uh, probably better for my mental health to not have that structure. 
Interesting. Because when I need to have like some Chris time or when I need to go do something at a certain time, I just go do it. Right. And if, if I'm more of a high performer at a certain time of day, that's when I try to schedule my client sessions because it's just, it's, it's more sort of cohesive with, with how I operate kind of thing, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Cool. Um, so moving, (laughs) moving on through my list of questions. So I think a good percentage of Edmonton's fitness industry has seen you at events or has had some kind of interaction with you and you always seem to be wanting to leave a positive lasting impact on people. So my question for you is who are three people who have had the left or sorry, have left the biggest lasting positive impact on you after meeting them one time? All right. that's a tough one. Well, it's, I say it's a tough one because if somebody listens to this and they don't hear their name, <laughs> that doesn't they, mean that they didn't leave an impact. On exactly. You. Exactly. I think people are going to understand who, who has left an impact on me and, and why, but I think even more people need to understand that everybody that I interact with plays a role of some part, whether it yeah. be somebody that I met for like 10 seconds, somebody that I've never met and I interact with on mm-hmm. Instagram, everybody plays a role. Yeah. I'd say some that stand out, uh, obviously for me, Dr. Farah Sharif, she's been monumental. Um, I remember when the first time I went to her spin class, I was like, oh, okay, like, this is cool, this is high energy, this seems like a quality class. Like, mm-hmm. that was kind of when I was just sort of a little skeptical about spin. I was in it because I knew I was chubby and I knew <laughs> it would make me less chubby. It was just a matter of, like, like facts. Yeah. Like, I knew that that thing was going to be effective and it didn't matter if I enjoyed the process or not. Right. And then I just remember there was, like... There was one morning in particular where just it felt like everything came crashing and burning down. And I think I honestly wanted to cancel a class. Mm -hmm. But with these classes, when when you're canceling last minute, you still have to pay for it. And me being pretty damn cheap, (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't willing to do that. So I hustled there. Might as well get your money's worth. Uh, Totally. And I just remember feeling so upset, just down. And... That day, I'm pretty sure she played a, a Coldplay song that just struck me. And I just remember doing like a standing jog. Yeah. And just thinking, holy shit, like I barely know this person and I feel like they have my back. And class by class, like there, there's just a few songs that really struck me mm-hmm. and just gave me this resounding feeling that, hey, like I'm going to be okay. And there's people that have my back and then it just built and built and built. And as that sort of relationship grew, like I got to know more about her. She got to know more about me. She's been a big supporter. She's always been in my corner. Yeah. And the fact that she's in a lot of other people's corner too is admirable, like genuinely Mm -hmm. caring about people, not just sort of caring about them for a business but caring about yeah. them behind the scenes i've never met her but i've heard from multiple people like how amazing of a human she is she's gotten like seven shout outs on this podcast oh, and we're yeah. on the 11th episode there you go <laughs> yeah no i've only heard the best things about her i mean I, you talk about her very frequently when you're like oh this is going on and i talked to far and this is what her the advice she gave me and i think i'm gonna go do this because you know i really trust her and like yeah, I've only ever heard great things about her. Okay, so there's one person. Anyone I gotta else? keep going down the list. Next one is Mr. Dean Guido. There you go. That man has been the real MVP. Also has been on the podcast. Also on the podcast. Uh, so here's his impact for me. Um, I'm pretty sure he started randomly liking some of my posts on Instagram. And I was like, who's this jacked guy? And I'm pretty sure, like, my first impression was nothing like what I know of him now. Hmm. I just kind of thought, wow, like, dude's, like, tough, and he just keeps keeps just liking things or commenting random things. Like, I just, I didn't quite get him. But then, over time, I was like, ooh, that thing was funny that he posted. And it just, I sort of bought into the Dean, the Dean vibe. Yeah. And 
Then there was the the industry night video that I made, and I involved a lot of people for that. It was like the what's up? Oh my god! I remember hating that and being like, "Why did you do this?" It was hilarious. <laughs> people, everybody loved the video. The video was the best. Um, and so he got involved in that because I reached out to L two and the team there. Um, and I, I still hadn't met him yet. But then at industry night, he was one person who actually like made a special effort to like plow through the crowd and mm-hmm. shake my hand and say hi and we actually had a chat for something like 20 minutes that must have made you feel pretty good well of course yeah but it was just neat to actually get to know a person yeah like they, there's nothing more valuable than truly getting to know a person mm-hmm. and then i think we just started just randomly chatting i think we were probably chatting before that but we we just kept like talking back and forth on instagram yeah and he was super supportive in uh, my uh, pursuit to become a trainer. Mm-hmm. He, when you're doing your CanFit Pro certification, uh, first you do like in class stuff for three days, okay. and then you do a written test, mm-hmm. and then you do a practical. Okay. And he is a CanFit Pro trainer, oh. so he has credentials to do the practical. So he did my practical test. Sweet. He was super supportive of me. That's awesome. And like he he dropped everything to make time for me so I could kind of get on with my, my personal timeline. Right. But yeah, just kind of like coached me going into it and just made me feel way less nervous about it because I think I was just really nervous. I just, I wanted to get it. I wanted to be in the industry. Yeah. And he was a big part of uh, me, me working for L2, like super supportive of like what I needed to work on and like Good. where, where my opportunities for growth were. Mm-hmm. And even as everything, everybody's kind of gone on, on their different path, mm-hmm. he stayed in contact. He checks in, he uh, big cheerleader, great guy. And I consider him a really good friend. So really, really big influence. Number three, Jordan Jeske. So the story with, uh, Jordan Jeske and I is like, him, I saw him on Instagram, I liked his vibe, I thought he was a really personable, be yourself kind of guy. Mm-hmm. And he made the idea of being a personal trainer something that looked fun. Like fun in not like, uh, oh, we're just gonna sit down on this bench and watch people do bicep curls. Fun in, uh, be creative, have events, mm-hmm. um, really care about your people, have fun with your people. Yeah have some knowledge, always learn more. Like I could see he was getting more certifications and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I was learning that if you want to do something, you find a person that's doing it and figure out how they did it. Yeah. And so I messaged him and like in a day he was like, yeah, I'm going to set aside some time for you. I'm going to call you and then I'll give you some advice. So we talked and I was like, what kind of certification should I get? Like, I was thinking of doing Nate, but what certification did you do? Yeah. And he said he did CanFit Pro. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, as long as you are self-disciplined enough to uh, continue getting that knowledge, then it's it's a certification where you can be just as valuable as any other certification. Like Perfect. There, there's People give a certification that can be done in a short period of time a bad reputation. Okay. But they're not factoring in the amount of work and the amount of hours that some of those people are putting in to their education. Mm-hmm. They're learning from from doctors, from physiotherapists, from like specialists in different realms. Okay. And they're, they're piling on more credentials. Mm-hmm. Whereas a person, not all people, but some people who might take like a two-year program or something might be less inclined to do so. Mm-hmm. I think if you're hungry and you want to survive in the industry, you're going to give yourself quite a good skill set yeah. with any certification you want. It, it doesn't matter what the name or title is. Like if, if you want to be really good at something, you're going to do what it takes to be really good at something. Yeah, and continue to grow. Like I think like things change over time, and you don't want to get bored either doing it. So yeah. keeping it fresh, learning, and yeah. Well, we have like a responsibility to our clients to do things to the best of our ability. And yeah. if we know it's not the best of our ability, we better mm-hmm. get on ourselves to keep learning. 
And do you find too when you're learning sometimes that helps reveal that like that passion too of like hey look I've been doing something the same way for a while here's a different way to do it and you're just like refreshed kind of for sure and I'm lucky to kind of be amongst people who are really highly geared that way yeah like I chat with Dean all the time and the amount of like ongoing knowledge that he's gone through mm -hmm. is like unreal I don't know how his brain is still functioning because it's jam-packed with info. <laughs> the brain is a great thing. It's just shaking in his head right now. The poor guy just giving her. That's good, though. Yeah, and that's the kind of people that you want to have in your circle, the people that want it just as bad as you do. That's fair. All right, so I guess that's three people. You betcha. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so through your journey to where you are today, who has been the most impactful and has been there through and through to support you? Based on the answer you just gave, I'm going to assume you're going to go Farah. Well, it's the three of those people, but Farah has been super, super impactful. Yeah. Um, I think I got to give kudos to Jordan and Dean because when I had to, when I decided that a gym for me was going to be a gym on the east side, Mm-hmm. They, they knew that that would have some factors to it. Like, hey, is he still going to have clients? Like, hey, what's the situation like? And they mm -hmm. they both, like, texted me quite a few times and just, hey, man, like, how are you doing? Like, mm -hmm. uh, are you finding that you're getting enough clients? Like, how's life? And that means a lot. Like, you can't do that enough. Yeah, checking in with people makes a big difference. For sure. And it's simple, too, right? Like, it's not like you have to move a mountain to do something like that. Absolutely. And I have to give some kudos. There is a, a number of gym owners around Edmonton that actually reached out to me on social media hmm. and made sure I was going to land on my feet. That's good. Which is pretty sweet. I, I like think that, that says a lot about you too, though. Because people see that you're willing, you, you have that ambition and you're willing to make that effort. Yeah. Because if you're just like some slacker who's just like, oh yeah, whatever, don't care too much about it, people aren't going to put in that time. Yeah. They're, they're not going to care. Yeah. So it's really neat. Yeah. It's a testament to you. Well, thanks. So, since you're always pushing your positivity, do you ever get tired of pushing that positivity? I think everybody gets tired of pushing the positivity. Do you ever have a bad day, Chris? Of course. Of course. Uh, I think I've become more and more self-aware as time has gone by to know exactly what I need when I have a bad day. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's about being around the right kind of people. I, well, I have some friends that have really been true MVPs, like, uh, my friend Dustin and my friend Jeff. Yeah. They've always been good sounding boards for me, always good sort of, like, kind of like ringside coaches. Um, there's lots of times when they'll give me advice, and then later on, I'll eventually finally take that advice. Yeah. But I think throughout all of my my low times when I don't feel motivated, mm -hmm. I've been able to check in with them. And it's like, with me and my friend Dustin, I can tell him that I'm having a shitty day and he can he can either prescribe what I should do yeah, or he'll be like, hey, he'll just just say, hey, you want to hang out, knowing that I need that kind of yeah. thing. Okay. And so to have that kind of a, a support circle is really helpful, really, really good. That's awesome to have that too. So that's pretty much how you pull yourself out. Then you kind of reach out to those around you and knowing what you need. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you don't need people. Sometimes you just need like an exercise, or just sleep. Sleep yeah. is great. Sleep is so important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember my mom. Anytime I go for a sleepover as a kid, she'd always tell the other parents like, "You need to make sure that she sleeps because otherwise they're not going to be friends anymore because <laughs> she will be so mean to them." Yeah. Sleep is is very important. Um, so something that I haven't mentioned yet is that I do teach bar classes and Chris was actually one of the first people to come to one of my classes back when I was doing my training. And I think that goes to show how supportive he is of other people in this industry and, and building that community. Um, yeah, cause you came, that was, I think maybe my second or third pilot class. I don't even think I had met you in person yet and you showed up. Yeah. And it, <laughs> And people were like looking around me like, who's this guy showing up for bar <laughs> class? And But you did everything that I asked of the class. You were smiling most of the time. If you weren't smiling, you looked a little bit afraid, but I'm, I don't blame you. 
Um, we're going to have photo evidence of you being there. Yeah. So I think, yeah. So if anyone hasn't had Chris show up for their class, just bug him and, and he'll <laughs> show up. I can attest to that. But I guess my question from Liz is, of all the different classes that you've taken, what has been the furthest out of your comfort zone? That's tough. Um, generally, like, I just kind of go into the thing, I'm like, okay, we're doing this, uh, this is fitness. <laughs> but I think the thing that's been sort of the, the toughest is probably all the different variations of bar. Like, I've tried out most of the studios that offer bar in the yeah. city. And it's just when they're like, okay, you're going to put your leg up on this bar. I'm like, and we're going to what now? <laughs> I'm like, we're going to what? Huh? Yeah. And then we do that and it's kind of uncomfortable. And I'm like, all right, um, we're going to squat soon or what? No, no squats. Yeah. It's plies, so. no squats. <laughs> um. So of all the different things that you've tried, is there anything that like hooked you in right away and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to do this again that you keep going back to? Spin. I think everybody saw that one coming. Yeah, but okay, let's have a spin though. Um, you know, I did, uh, I did CrossFit for about a year. Yeah. And the, the gym that I was at was a really great community and I have nothing but good things to say about the coaches and I think... The community there was really good at supporting each other and it taught me a lot about the value of support between mm-hmm. not just between the coaches and clients but also clients and clients yeah so the more that you can make a space that feels like a home the better and that factored into a lot of, of where where we chose to uh, relocate mm-hmm. for invigorate training mm-hmm. we wanted a space where a person felt like the walls were their walls, where they felt not intimidated, where they felt supported. Yeah. And where everybody in the gym was cheering on everybody in the gym. And it's not to say that other spaces aren't like that, Mm -hmm. but uh, we're really happy with with the space that we found and what we're able to start to grow kind of thing. I think from feedback I've heard from people in the fitness community too is a lot of times why they stay somewhere is because of the atmosphere that's there Mm -hmm. or that they don't stay like I've had so many people that have said like oh yeah we come we come here because of the atmosphere we've tried other places and the atmosphere just isn't the same Mm -hmm. and that that goes a long way with with keeping people coming back so you know that I'm an introvert like a major introvert good luck getting me out of my house (laughs) I really struggle with trying new things and even just being social in general. Um, so I definitely admire your ability to always be putting yourself out there, getting into all these different classes that you've done, getting building that community around yourself and all these different relationships that you have, whether it's on social media, in the gym, or whatever it might be. Um, do you think it's fair to say that comes easily for you? Holy shit, you should have met me three years ago. Like, there was a time... And I think maybe it was just I got so comfortable with what you might call my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Like I had my thing that I did here, a thing that I did there, a thing that I did there. Like just with my like work life, Right. I always knew what to expect. And if it was something that I didn't know what to expect, then I was, oh, no panic. Mm -hmm. And I think what kind of helped is because throughout my whole, like when I got hooked into spin, that whole thing, always me by myself. Like, I think my friend Dustin came with me like three times. Yeah. But I've done hundreds of those things by myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the yeg fitness classes I went to, like, we'd be with the team or something, but they'd always be like, oh yeah, bring a friend. I'd be like, oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll see you there. Yeah. And the more things you're able to just do by yourself, the more aware you are that you are going to be okay and you don't mm-hmm. need somebody else to, to latch on to to feel safe. And so once you kind of make that your comfort zone, other things don't really bother you. Like you could have me do all kinds of fitnessy things. I'm like, okay, I'll probably sweat. I might, I might not nail it on everything. And mm-hmm. some people might look at me funny because it's a class full of girls and an unexpected <laughs> guy comes but like yeah. nothing new like this is what we do we just go to the thing and we do the thing pretty simple you just gotta make just your, don't overthink it you gotta make your your place of discomfort become your place of comfort 
Well, speak for yourself. I have <laughs> I have in my comfort zone. Fair enough. Um, so, I mean, you totally did me a solid when you showed up for my bar class, and I knew it was only fair that I had to return the favor and go to one of your spin classes. This was back when you were still doing spin. Um, I definitely avoided going as long as I possibly could. I gave you a lot of excuses. Mostly, I'm not getting up that early, and there's not enough time between when that's over and when I need to be at work to make that work. But then you did have a class on a weekend, and I knew I had to just suck it up and go. I was convinced I was going to die before I even got in the door. I'm not sure how many messages I sent you, but I'm like, if I die, like just like leave me there or something <laughs> and like it was so bad I remember you even had to help me like clip my shoes into the bike and you're just like no you're gonna be fine and I'm like nope I'm gonna die I went into like the back corner and I was like if I die or fall off this bike just leave me <laughs> and I think I'm legally allowed to do that <laughs> sorry but I was just like this is not gonna be good it was definitely a struggle I'm gonna admit I never went back but that's that's more of a me thing um so I guess my question for you is when you have those people showing up for the first time who are super hesitant, nervous, and all the rest of it, what do you do to help them get through that? I've been lucky that in my time when I was a spin instructor, there was a lot of people that came for their very first class. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm somebody that's pretty relatable. Like, I didn't... I wasn't so much like ready for spin when I went to spin. I wasn't mentally prepared. I wasn't like, all right, we got this. We're going to crush this. I I wasn't conditioned with my cardio. Like I, I had a fairly sedentary life when it came to doing things that got your heart rate up. Mm -hmm. So it came as a complete shock. And then I survived. Honestly, when, when I kind of show people some perspective of, hey, like, Usually, I, I have a picture from a trip that uh, some friends and I went to Hawaii, and it was maybe a few months before I really went hard on the spin classes, yeah. and it sort of shows what I looked like, and it even sort of embodies a bit of my uh, self-confidence in just how I'm, how I'm standing there, yeah. and when people actually see that perspective, and especially after the class is over, they're like, oh, like... He's not lying. Like, yeah. it, it's okay to be a little uncomfortable the first time, but things do get better. Mm -hmm. And just being supportive. Like, I've, I've had some chats with people, and it's really meaningful to actually say, hey, like, you're going to be okay. I got your back. If you need anything, I'm here kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like, nobody, nobody's going to go to a bad place in a fitness class. People... People want to support you. The other riders want to support you. Like if, if you're doing training, there's clients across the gym that want to see you crush a PR. Doesn't matter if the their trainer knows the trainer that you're working with kind of thing. Right. It's just in our nature. We're, we're a big tribe. Mm -hmm. We want to go <laughs> like we, we inherently want other people to succeed because it makes us feel good. Right. One thing I definitely noticed when I did take your spin class is the difference in your confidence outside of the class versus in the class. You, outside of class, were a very kind of awkward, giggly kind of a guy. And I think I made fun of you probably more than I should have for that. Um, but then when I saw you like leading that class, it was like a whole other person. And like the confidence was through the roof. And it, it took me by surprise, to be honest. Um... But now, more than a year later, I guess it would be, like, I don't see that giggly version of Chris anymore. I see more of that, what did I call it on my list? The spin boss version of Chris. <laughs> that that you're kind of owning your abilities and, and you know that you've, you've got a handle on things. Um, so what do you think would be some of the things that got your confidence to where it is now? I think... It's, it's kind of tough to describe, but I'm going to take my best to take a stab at it. Essentially, we, we have sort of like this pattern of thinking, and you can use like a simple application and apply it to a bigger thing. So in order to reassure yourself that you're going to be okay with a career thing, you can actually tie that to something with 
a physical thing. Mm -hmm. You can take your workout and find something where you feel supported because we all need to feel supported when we're feeling successful. Mm -hmm. Find something where you feel supported and then find something that challenges you. Push yourself through that challenge. Accept that you may fail, but understand that failure is not like the end. Right. And then see yourself succeed. And then apply that to your real life outcome. So my example is, uh, some people might realize that some people might not, but like the reason why I'm in spin classes right now and just take them mm-hmm. is because I can apply that to my real life. Like I can, I push myself pretty hard. I don't think I ever half ass it because I'm trying to apply that to real life. I know that I could fail. There's lots of things that could screw up. All my clients could leave and I could go broke and I could be foreclosing on my mortgage. Things could go wrong, but that doesn't mean that they will and it doesn't mean that they have to. Right. I can also succeed. I can kill it. I can push myself really hard. I can get out of my comfort zone. I can feel really uncomfortable for a long time. I can get really good at feeling uncomfortable. And so that's why doing something like a spin class works for me because I get really, really good at pushing myself to my highest potential, even though it kind of sucks sometimes, even though you have to make some sacrifices sometimes and I can be successful and I can do it over and over and over. And going to that class reminds me of that. That's fair. It's kind of a sad note, but I remember, I think... I think it was Bumble on social media. They posted this thing about taking the word failure out of your vocabulary and switching it in with something else. And they had one of those stickers of what would you replace it with? And it was kind of neat to see like some people switched it out for opportunity. So like this isn't a failure. This is an opportunity or a learning experience or, or something else. Because so many people just see like failure as um, an excuse to give up. But if you switch it out for something else, it's not actually failure. It's just... A challenge or an obstacle and you can keep going even if all your clients leave and you're get foreclosed on your mortgage life doesn't stop you got to keep going right completely um so we have mentioned i guess that you have taken a step away from from the bike and you're you're not leading at true ride anymore but i have noticed you posting about getting back on the spin bike do you think there will be a point where you're leading again? Kind of reflecting on sort of how passionate I was about like getting to be on the bike. Like for people who know me really well, it was something that I wanted to do quite strongly for mm-hmm. for a long time. It's kind of what pushed me into being a, a personal trainer because I was like, come high, come the hell or high water. Yeah, I'm going to be coaching someone in some capacity whether I have to find a different avenue to do it or not and I think it's great because I think I'm a good personal trainer Mm -hmm. but I also feel like I'm a good leader on a bike I think there's so much stuff that I I can speak to there's so much potential for impact yeah and so I'm just going to uh, keep developing myself as someone who's a leader, a good influence, someone who's uh, a good example in physical wellness and just see, see where things take me. But I think it's something that I'm good at, so I could totally see it in my future. So stay tuned. There might yeah. be a Chris leading another spin class one day. You never know. So I want to go back a little bit here. I want to go back to the day that you quit your quote-unquote regular day job at the warehouse. I remember you sending me texts about what happened and probably hoping for some level of reassurance. And I'm pretty sure my reaction was, what did you do? Are you crazy for quitting your day job? Um, I know I grew up with the mentality of always having a plan before putting something into action, especially if it's like a big life decision kind of a thing. Um, I know you talked about your parents changing careers and stuff, but did you kind of grow up with that same philosophy as like have a plan before you do something or has it always just kind of been fly by the seat of your pants? (laughs) It was totally, I think I probably shocked my parents a little bit in some sense because for sure they, they love, they, their generation is you don't spend money that you don't have. Right. You want to have like some structure. You want to have. You want to plan ahead Mm -hmm. and you want to be stable kind of thing. And 
so in the the days leading up there, all right, Chris, uh, like. You got you got a job lined up like you, you put in your notice you got a job lined up and I was like, yeah yeah I uh, went for a few interviews and I think I'm good like I, I think it'll be like a slow start but I think I'm good to go and I'll do like this for part time mm-hmm. I have a plan I remember like I had it was like three interviews lined up for the same like franchise kind of thing yeah and then I was also I was gonna be an Uber Eats driver. Oh, I remember you talking about so, that. So, like, yeah. I registered for that, and I was just waiting to be authenticated, to be approved as a driver. Mm. Um, and so my, my parents were a little skeptical. Yeah. But I think they had seen... I would stayed consistent to something I was passionate for a while then. Mm-hmm. And so I think any of the doubts as to whether I would be successful or not were washed away. Yeah. Um, also, like... Pretty much I set a target for myself that I was going to make my move before my uh, 26th birthday. I was like, at this point, it was kind of, I guess it's almost like a late quarter late crisis kind of thing. But I just, I had been with the other job for five years. Yeah. And I put in my time. Like, it's time to see what else you can do with your life. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so the, the days are going on in my two weeks notice. But then I... Uh, we kind of came to an agreement, me and my my old bosses, that hey, uh, we're we're just gonna have you have you leave a little early, and then you have a little more time to transition. I was oh okay, mm-hmm. and I remember packing up all my stuff, and we said our goodbyes, and they gave me a card and all this stuff. Yeah, and I was on my way home, and I had had my third interview with the place that I applied to, <laughs> and I get home from the last time. Coming from my old job, that was like my my safe place, my mm-hmm. stable ground, and I get this call and it's like, yeah, uh, Chris, uh, we're we're not gonna hire you, and I just remember being like, oh, okay, and I don't think I said bye. <laughs> I think I just hung up the phone on the guy. And oh my god, I can't even like. What was your emotion? Do you holy think that that's crap! Funny? Like I, I was kind of hyperventilating at yeah. home. And then I just remember, like, hey, like, we're going to be okay. We're going to be fine. Like, we did this for a reason because we know we can do it. And then uh, Uber Eats, they never approved me as a driver. Really? So I was like, what the hell? What do you have to do to get approved from Uber Eats that you didn't uh, I don't approved? think they like my picture or something. I don't know what the hell was going on. But, uh, oh, I think they judge you based on your appearance? No, it's I don't Uber know. Eats. I think it was just a, a glitch. A glitch. We'll go with that. But we won't worry about it too much because, to be honest, Uber Eats drivers don't make all that much money. No, probably not. As time went on, I uh, I just knew, I know how to make money when I need to make money. I've done, like, there's brand ambassador jobs out there where you can, like, work on behalf of a company for a sort of, like, a contractor to represent different brands. Yep. So that's how I did, like, the Alberta Milk set up a thing for the world's longest hockey game thing. Mm-hmm. So that was a little bit of a gig. I obviously had, like, some pay coming from the old job that kind of kept me safe for a few weeks. Right. I was doing the... Uh, Doing the true ride spin instructing, so that's some income that can't be discounted. Right. Um, and then I was lucky because one day I was just chilling at home, and Andrew Coates, another person who's really supported me, he's a trainer in the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, he needed somebody to help him chip away some snow or some ice at his client's driveway, and went and helped with that. <laughs> I remember getting a text being like, "I'm so sore. I've been chipping ice all day." It was nuts. It was like. <laughs> Three hours of probably the toughest snow chipping clearing ever, but I just knew I was like, this is an opportunity to just work your butt off. Yeah. And it was great because I also got like sort of like a mentorship session with him. Him and oh, I yeah. chatted and he gave me some advice and he's always been someone to give me advice. The things you can do while chipping ice. Oh, totally. And so that, that gave me some income as well. I'm very, very grateful for that day. And... Just kind of went from there. Uh, Vance Bosch, got to give a shout out to him because he, somehow we just kind of talked more and more on social media. The yeah. first time it ever happened, I think his wife had given him this black tar stuff to pull out his nose hairs. Oh my God. <laughs> and I remember sliding oh. into the DMs and be like, hey bro. That like, looks so painful. Did, did that work or, or what? And he was like, I don't know. Like I just did it once. I don't know, oh. I don't know if I'll do it again. And I just... That was our first interaction. And then we would just kind of continue like chatting with each other. And then 
Uh, I remember I called him out once come to my class and him and Rob Clark came together to my spin class. Yeah. Um, but him and I had been chatting about my transition into fitness. He's someone who's very like personal development oriented, very fitness, health balance, mm-hmm. like all that stuff. That's a priority to him. Yeah. And just a super good guy. And I remember I had seen on social media, he was talking about the minimum wage increase. And while that benefits me on one side of the spectrum, it also affects the business of local restaurants because their operating costs go high. And like when it really comes down to it, like the bigger wage is from like the tips that people get in that industry. And I just, he spoke so passionately about the topic and it was not so much about being like as much as people would think, oh man, it's just a business person being cheap. No, it's more about the sustainability of the business in how it runs. Like yeah. you can't have as many as of employees and you yeah. can't do all these different things. Yeah. And you still need to be able to pay rent and all the overhead and everything else. Plus your employees, like there's so many costs that people don't even realize when it comes to running a business. Yeah. And yeah. I remember seeing in the comments, it was, he, he spoke to the, uh, kind of like the standard of happiness of of central employees and like how they were taken care of. Yeah. And that resonated with me. I was, if I'm going to work in a bar, I'll I'll work in his bar. Right. And I talked to him and I was like, Hey man, uh, I don't care what, what job it is, but do you have any work for me by chance? He's Mm -hmm. actually like, (laughs) we, we are not hiring anybody right now. Yeah. And then he ended up pulling some strings. I think like, I got an interview pretty quick. Yeah. He's he's always been a huge supporter, so I have to give that shout out. And Jesse too, like You're still there. The they're both they've both uh been big cheerleaders for me and it's awesome. And Neil too. Neil's rode my, my spin class as well. So There you go. There we go. Done with essential shout outs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So I guess looking back, would you have done anything differently? No. No. <laughs> that's an easy answer <laughs> all right so i think you did mention that the gym that you were were working out of recently shut the doors and you and two other trainers have grouped together and created invigorate training i think you've mentioned that once yes so far um so can you tell us a bit about that and what it's like to start something up so quickly and on your own so there there was a day when we all kind of sat together and uh we, we learned that L2 was just, it was going to have to close its doors and we were still going to be able to be trainers, but obviously we we're going to have to find a new space. And there's lots of ways that you can go from there. Like we, we could be independent trainers. I think no matter what Kelly and Emily probably would work together, hmm. but like we, we were really jiving as a team. Like we were already kind of being each other's supporters and from what I've learned in the last few years, there's nothing more valuable than having that community. It's essentially you, you're going to be successful if you feel supported. Yeah. And there are two people that helped me to feel supported. And I feel like I can give that back to them. And then it came down to fight or flight. Mm -hmm. It was basically okay shit. Like if we don't put something together, we're going to lose more clients. Yeah. So pretty much overnight I made a website. Um, we laugh about it because it was like literally, we went to bed and then in the morning I was like, hey, check out our website. And they're like, what? <laughs> and our social media. Yeah. Like, what? Surprise. So invigoratetraining.com, that's where it's at. Um, we we did a lot of uh, searching for what our space would look like, where it would be. We kind of pondered the idea of like being our own like facility, but mm-hmm. you crunch the numbers. You don't want to start up a gym, have that gym close down too. Yeah. Um, I happen to know Sean Smears through, uh, sport check, sport check days. Oh, that's going back. And yeah, I have a few, uh, mutual connections with him. So it was just, I think it was meant to be that I'd cross paths with him. He was creating, uh, raising the bar training and therapies or performance. I should say raising the bar performance training and therapies. So there's some offices for uh, physiotherapy or massage. Oh, We're sweet. still uh, looking at some some more people partnering on. And it wasn't just him, it was Andrew as well. Uh, the two of those boys set up a good space and we wanted to be a part of it. And they let us in with open arms. They've been extremely supportive. That's awesome. 
and we created our brand Invigorate Training because it allows us to support each other just on a like humanistic level mm-hmm. but also with hey like I find somebody that wants to train with a girl mm-hmm. there's two girls that are great trainers that I can refer them to and, yeah. and vice versa mm-hmm. we offer our group classes and yeah it's just it's better when you don't feel like you're on your own it's better when you have people like if if Emily went and learned something yeah. then I'm more inclined to want to learn something too and mm-hmm. same with Kelly and if one person's just killing it well the competitive side of me is gonna be like well I want to kill it too it's never gonna be like a takeaway thing it's right. gonna be like a beyond um, their level thing yeah that's fair yeah so what do you think would could you say like motivates the three of you and sets you apart from other places I think we we truly want to have an impact in the sense that it's really it's not about money it's about how how much better we can make life for people mm-hmm. and that's not to say that we're we're different from other trainers and that we want to make life better but just that uh we stand out for our passion kind of thing right i'd say we're just we're fired up we're ready to go we're doing this we're in this one of our uh, catchphrases is we're in this for you and when you when you think about it mm-hmm. The average uh, career span of a trainer is two years. Really? Yeah, mm-hmm. like people, it's such a tough go. I didn't like know if that you're strong. if you're not getting the clients that you want to get, or if if you're not working the hours that you want to work. Yeah. Um, personal trainers are highly targeted by like marketing companies and stuff. Okay. Because we get so good at marketing ourselves mm. that all the grunt work, all the training in in doing that is done. That makes sense. So like some, some financial companies will, will look to the trainer industry for, for new recruits and stuff. But honestly, like I strongly believe that I can make a huge impact Mm -hmm. and I see the same thing in Kelly and Emily. And so us working as a team, like we, we build off each other. We know our needs. Like sometimes we just send funny dog memes to each other (laughs) because people have bad days. Oh, totally. Imagine if we didn't have that team. Yeah. Who would send me funny dog, dog memes? Like, I... I'm sure you could find someone. Oh, but it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the same. No, you're right. It wouldn't be. Yeah. So, I want to explore your social media presence for a minute or two. So, you clearly use social media as a platform to promote what you're all about. And you've been pushing positive messages and highlighting everything that you've had on the go. So, oftentimes, when people put so much of themselves onto the public... T- or, sorry... People put so much of themselves online for public to consume. There's often some level of trolling and negativity that comes with that. Is that something that you've experienced much of? I think that sort of I've I've weeded out a lot of, of what would be trolls for me. Like, there's definitely some people who have sort of second guessed my abilities yeah. stuff like that but it's never been I haven't had any real harsh attacks or anything I def there's been times where I've posted things and I'm pretty sure I've been unfollowed by like 20 people all at once but you're not getting like comments from people saying but anything nobody ever says anything I just know sometimes I can get super passionate and have like a stance mm-hmm. and obviously people are gonna choose their sides not really knowing all the context yeah but it is what it is. You're never going to make everybody happy. Hmm. I know that on your last episode that you had with Chelsea, if people haven't heard that one yet, they should go listen to it. But you guys did chat about trolls quite a bit and some of the things that she's gone through. Um, so what is your way of dealing with negativity? Like if someone were to say something to you, like what would you do? The best tool and something that sometimes we just have to remind ourselves is every little piece of am- ammunition. Mm-hmm that somebody chucks at you is something that they negatively see in themselves. Right. So if you have somebody that, uh, there's lots of situations where I've I've had discussions with people that like are mentors in my life Mm -hmm. or people that have supported my my events that are doing really well in their own business. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of successful people have had somebody that said, hey, like, you really wanna, you really wanna do that or you really wanna be like that person, like really? Mm And it's because what they see in themselves, they're, they're seeing so much doubt in themselves that they need to dish that out on other people to feel better about themselves. And so 
you having that awareness to know like holy crap this person does not see themselves in a very positive light right that makes it better that makes it easier to deal with this kind of thing that's fair so here's a question that's really off topic but i'm curious about this and i'm kind of surprised i haven't asked you this before with all the things that you have on the go do you often have a chance to just do regular stuff like laundry and dishes the funny thing is i have all the time in the world to do laundry and dishes it's just a matter of like do you do them but i think it's important like it's something like i'm getting better at actually like handling those things sometimes i can get i'm a guy with a lot of different projects like what you know that i'm doing Mm -hmm. you you can always assume that behind the scenes i'm probably doing a lot more things as well like i i have a lot of like back burner plans yeah things that that are for future Chris Mm -hmm. and so sometimes I'll just be sitting on a chair like just planning things out thinking things out uh thinking about something that happened in the day and it's like I ate my food I put on the counter I walked away kind of thing but it's it's really healthy to take care of that shit too because it that's your atmosphere that's that's your your space you want it clear so that you can move forward in a in a clear confident sense don't look at the pile of dishes in my sink <laughs> it's actually like not that bad for me right now but that's good that's that's always been my thing of like i hate doing dishes yeah yeah all right are you up for a game oh i am all right i have put together a game of would you rather sure you ready for this i am all right so Chris, would you rather take a two-week trip to a foreign country of your choice or a month-long trip to multiple places around our own great nation? Oh, that's tough. I'd say two-week trip. Um, would you rather go out to eat or stay in and cook your own food? I think if I had the ability to buy whatever I wanted to get, yeah. I think I'd rather stay in and cook. Sweet or savory? Sweet. Would you rather get up early or stay up late? Get up early. Would you rather do more reps with less weight or less reps with more weight? Depends on the day. If, if I'm feeling really good that day, it's going to be less reps with more weight. If I'm feeling off, it's going to be more reps with less weight. Okay. Would you rather go a week without your phone or a month without music? Oh, I could probably go a week without my phone. I like music. Do you think you could give up your phone for a week? I'd just yell really loud out the window. <laughs> Every time I had something to say, I'd run around with my picture of myself and just yell. Oh I'd yell God. all of my encouraging words so that my 40 people who like it would hear. Okay. Sure. We'd be good. Okay. You couldn't even, like, book classes on Mind Body or anything. Oh, I guess you could on your computer. I don't right? have Mind Body. You don't but- book classes on Mind Body? I guess I have book classes, but yeah. actually technically, yeah. still not on my body. The places that I go, I would still just walk in, oh, and okay. I think I'd be okay. They'd make it happen. They'd take care of me. They'd understand. They'd I can get risky. Have his phone. We're in yeah, trouble. Yeah, but, but if the class is full, the class Computer. is full. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, would you rather hike in the mountains or walk down a busy city street? Mountains, 100%. Yeah, me too. Would you rather be a deep sea di- sorry deep sea diver or an astronaut? Astronaut. Why? Because I don't want to know about what's down in the deep sea as much as I want to know what's in space. Cool. Would you rather live in a house Big Brother style where everyone's watching everything you do and you have no privacy, or have no human contact for one month? Big Brother. You're like the opposite of me. I don't want... like, leave me alone. I changed careers because I didn't want to be isolated. That's Give me true. people. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the, here's the question, kind of inside of the situation we're in right now. Would you rather be interviewed or be the interviewer? I'm cool with both. Okay. <laughs> I have some rapid fire questions for you now. I'm ready. All right. So if you could be, at, or sorry, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? If I could have a superpower, I think it would be uh, teleportation. Interesting. Favorite food? Probably pizza. Favorite movie? Oh, that's tough, but I like the Lord of the Rings movies. There's a lot of those ones. Can you be more specific? Damn it! Let's just pick the first one. 
Fellowship of the Ring, I think. I was going to say, in the order that they came out in or the order of the story? Okay. <laughs> like the original cut or like the like extended edition or like... I'd be down with the extended edition, make it worth my while kind of thing. Yeah. There's a lot that you don't see in the original. Exactly. Cut. Um, Favorite type of workout? Uh, I'm going to say two because obviously spin is something that's prevalent, but mm-hmm. also I do strongly prioritize and advocate for strength training and if you told me i could only do one thing i would say deadlift because it basically it works out quite a bit of your body yeah. and it's something where i feel competent and strong and it's gonna be a good healthy sustainable thing for me cool how often do you call your mom to say hi daily <laughs> every day except for like the odd day here and there i talk to my parents hmm. What's the last time that you felt afraid? Um, there's been like little little times here and there, but I haven't felt nearly as afraid in the last like year or so as I did before I made my career change. I felt more afraid leading up to my career change. I'm glad your answer wasn't on your way here. I'm afraid to see how bad I would butcher this for you. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> change your mindset. <laughs> Chris, how many cups of coffee do you usually have in a day? It used to be a real problem. Yeah. I think especially when I was working in the warehouse, I'd probably have like eight cups of coffee. Mm -hmm. Uh, What I learned was sometimes you're just having a cup of coffee, just have a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. Also, there's, uh, you can't have enough water. Like, water is important. You can have too much water. Yeah, but like, it's pretty hard to get to that it, point. It's pretty tough to actually hit that two liters a day or whatever it would be for your body and your weight and everything. Mm-hmm. So just get your water in and then you don't need as much coffee. Now I'd say I probably have like a cup or two a day. Huh. That's not bad. Um, the last question is kind of mean, <laughs> but it's something all of us bar sh- instructors have, even if we don't necessarily admit it. So what is your favorite exercise to have a client struggle through, but you would hate to do yourself? So I've encouraged myself to adopt a mindset in which that everything that I have a client do, I can't hate it because I need to teach them to be able to do it sustainably. And if secretly I wouldn't do it sustainably, then who am I? There is an exercise that I can show a person and they're going to look at it and they're going to be like, oh, that's simple. Mm -hmm. And they can even do it and feel like it's simple. Yeah. But then I can cue it up really well and it wrecks them. And it's a dead bug. Like, if you're actually having your back flat throughout that entire thing, like, Mm -hmm. you're having to flex your external obliques so much that you're going to feel like they're going to rip right off. If you don't, then you need to cue yourself up a bit more. It's kind of fun seeing that journey because everybody's like, Oh, whatever. I just have to fling my legs like a dead bug. <laughs> it's like, ho, 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 you're going to learn today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We get that with bar all the time. They're like, oh, this is easy. The heaviest weight you have is four pounds. It's like no one ever sustains themselves on four pounds. But, yeah. All right. So we've talked about your childhood, family, career changes, influences, social media, and what you've been up to lately. A few random things. So what's next for Chris? It's kind of cool. I was having a conversation with somebody every so often when I feel like really just stuck. Like I don't know what to do next, what my next move is to make make progress. Mm -hmm. I go on what I call a vision quest. Usually usually that's like a quick trip to the mountains. All it takes is a day trip. Mm -hmm. Took a a few in a row last year before I really jumped into the fitness industry. I think it was in like November. And I had just got my CanFit certification. It was all set in stone. It took me a really long time to actually do that. And it was procrastination and just putting things off. Mm-hmm. But I remember having a conversation with somebody and being like, I'm going to make a big ripple effect in the fitness industry. And it's exciting because I'm only getting started. Right. And I don't feel like I've made that ripple effect yet. So there's lots of things to look forward to in the year and the years and in all that time to come. Sweet. So the final question that you ask all of your guests, what piece of advice would you like to give about living your most authentic life? I think when I was a kid, I would see myself doing a thing and be like, if only I could do that. And the example I'd use is like sitting in class thinking, 
I wish I could be like like a gym teacher that uh, made videos that uh, didn't have to teach math because it seems like all gym teachers <laughs> teach math and like just do all these things. But oh, and just do computers too. Like I like making websites. Yeah. But it's not a job, so I can't do that. And I just be like, well, maybe I'll go into film. I just made all these excuses. Mm-hmm. Now I'm older, and it seems that I've stopped making as many excuses because I'm I'm a trainer who's basically a gym teacher. Yeah. And I'm making videos mm-hmm. for my training. Or social media. And I made a website. Like, I'm doing all the things that I like doing. Yeah. And I'm still good. Like, so just do the things that you want to do. Mm-hmm. And don't, like, sort of apologize for the fact that nobody else is doing them. Don't let other people's thoughts change what your plan is. Like, like if somebody says you can't do it, don't care. Just do it. That's all. Simple. Do what you want to do easy Mm -hmm. so thanks for letting me turn the tables on you today and being such an open book for those that are listening and maybe don't know where to find you can you share with the listeners where they can find you all right so you can obviously find me on my instagram which is probably how you'll find this podcast and it's at christian little i'm also on facebook but it's not quite the same i'm not on that as much um the training brand that I operate under with Kelly and Emily is called Invigorate Training. You can find us there at invigoratetraining.com. If you ever want to send me an email, it's chris at invigoratetraining.com. And Raising the Bar Performance and Training is where we're operating out of. It's on the east side of town. Uh, if you ever want to check us out there, the address is 472076F. So come check us out. We'll, uh, our first group class is free, so if you ever want one, uh, send us a DM or send me an email. Perfect. That's all I have for you. Sweet. Yeah. It's been good chatting. Thanks. See you next time. <laughs>